Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm your co-host, Alton Gansky, the author of uh, numerous fiction and nonfiction, book-length kinds of things, as well as teacher of writing, and even been known to read a little now and again. So what what don't you do? Maybe we should just try and uh, be a little more efficient with our time and just list things that we don't do and haven't done in our lives. So make money. Yeah, um. that's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, you'll notice Molly is not with us tonight. We're hoping she'll join us uh, either a little bit later. She may not join us on the show itself, but she may be popping into the chat room for those of you uh, at AaronGansky.com following along with us. Uh, she's not feeling super great tonight, so we're hoping that she feels better and, and gets some rest. And uh, so our thoughts and, and prayers go out to her. Uh, just a quick reminder to some of those of you who are listening to our audio-only podcast, you can find us live every other Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, you can do that either at YouTube or just more easily at AaronGansky.com. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up if you would and uh, add us to all your social media channels so that we can interact with you and talk and you can ask us questions and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, I do want to give a quick shout out to our newsletter. I guess you don't give a newsletter a shout out. You get, Molly does our newsletter, so shout out to Molly. But uh, another plug here for our newsletter uh, at AaronGansky.com where you can subscribe. Uh, we are not doing the novel spotlight anymore. So if you're curious about that, why are we not doing that? There's a a number of reasons why we've chosen to do that, but the the primary reason that we've concluded is is that uh, we want to really reserve the time that we have on these casts to talk about the issues at hand. So rather than uh, somebody clicking on a YouTube link that says, we're going to talk about character tonight and waiting through 15 minutes of us talking about books and such, um, we're trying to get to the meat of the episodes a little bit more quickly and expediently, and uh, it should be easier for those of you who are watching past episodes to be able to kind of jump right into it and and uh, get to the part that you find relevant and, and meaningful. So um, we are not completely abandoning it. It may take a different shape, but it, we have moved that to the newsletter. That's the new spot. So if you're interested in um, things outside of just writing fiction in terms of who we are as people, what's going on in our lives, how we drink our coffee, whatever the case may be, uh, what books we're reading, what podcasts we're listening to, what movies we're watching, uh, those types of things, um, and kind of get a writer's take on a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, the newsletter is the place to do that. So be sure to subscribe to that. Molly's done a great job with that. We're looking forward to some really cool stuff coming out. So uh, if you haven't already done so, great. Now, we are starting a new series in Pops. This is a, uh, a, a series that we kind of came up with together. It was more your idea, uh, this kind of gross anatomy of a novel. So uh, you want to kind of clue us in on, on what you have in mind for this series coming up? So what you're doing is right off the bat blaming me. Is that it? Absolutely. Well, if you like it, it was my idea. If you don't, then it was definitely all Pops' idea. <laughs> Uh, gross anatomy. Uh, when you go to med school, one of the, your earliest classes, one of your first classes is gross anatomy. And that's where you learn about the human body at the big scale. In other words, you're doing uh, dissection of a human body uh, to, to learn these things. And then the term has uh, moved over to many other things uh, where gross anatomy just means you take a big look. Uh, it, yeah, you take a big picture look at something. And what we're doing is we're going to look at the key elements some of which we've talked about some here and there or in different ways, but uh, go back to the basics and take a, a closer, deeper, uh, more practical look at uh, some of the key elements that goes into the stew we call writing. Um, has so many different parts to it. And, you know, for Blue Ridge, I'm doing uh, some reviews of uh, and critiquing of some manuscripts that are, are sent to me. And uh, so I see the things that people usually miss when they're first starting. And one of them is uh, has to do with character. Character, of course, is extremely important. So that's what we're doing this week. We're going to uh, look at character, and we're very fortunate because uh, Aaron has pulled together really a great outline. Uh, and it's based on your creative writing course. It is. It's actually something that I put together uh, some time ago. Oh man, uh, for a a. Uh presentation I was doing at a writer's conference and uh, they wanted something about character. And I, I really struggled with trying to come up with a new way to spin character. Um, and 
I've, I've read so many things about character and what you should do with character building memorable characters and how to make, you know, um, dynamic characters and characters that come off the page and characters that slap you in the face and do other nefarious things and um, characters to fall in love with, which seems a little bit weird, but yeah, I mean, come on, who hasn't fallen in love with a character at some point? Um, this might be getting a little too personal. We'll, Pick your we'll talk, pocket. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that later, but Steal your car keys. <laughs> so what I started to do is, is uh, I, I try to think about it from almost an anatomical standpoint to kind of keep with our theme of gross anatomy here um, and, and try to break down the elements of character. What pieces, uh, what's the, the gestalt of a character in a piece? What's the parts that make up the whole, what makes a character greater than the, than the sum of their parts. And for me, there are really four different aspects to a character. So I call them the four pillars, four pillars of kill character development. Uh, and that's what I was uh, kind of put together today for our notes. So uh, should we just jump right in, you think? Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. There's, uh, there's really uh, quite a bit to cover in all of this, uh, but you really cannot learn uh, too much about character because without character, uh, a book will fail. And I think we've all had the experience of reading a, a book that has some thinly drawn character. You can't quite figure out what's going on, whether you like them or not, that sort of thing. Uh, the characters have to come to life. And that's uh, something that's difficult for new writers uh, to pull off. But when you see it done well, it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, so you've pulled this uh, together. By the way, you, you can uh, look at the show notes, which I recommend on these, because these are worth having, uh, what Aaron's pulled together. And you'll find them at uh, AaronGansky.com. Uh, so if you miss anything while we're talking, you can always go and look at those. And... Uh, you can see it all laid out in outline form. All righty. So you have these four pillars. Mm -hmm. Tell us the first one. The first one is physicality. And uh, when I ever, every time I start this, people think, oh, oh, you know, physical description. They have brown eyes and black hair. Oh, okay. That's part of it. We'll get into that. Um, but typically what I like to say is that those, uh, for the most part, those details don't tell us much about a character. They don't tell us about who a character is. Um, just the fact that they've got, you know, long fingers, that's a nice detail. It's great, but it doesn't tell me who they are as a person. Um, instead, again, in, in thinking of anatomical terms, uh, think about the anatomy of your character, the physical anatomy of your character. There are characters all have physical bodies in a physical world. Now, of course they're imaginary. Um, but when we imagine them, and we dream them up. We need to draw from our personal experiences, our physical, tangible experiences in a physical, tangible world um, and and show that, demonstrate that uh, through our writing, uh, whether or not they're human. Uh, Pops, you you even mentioned that here in, in the notes, some examples here. Yeah, character is uh, really, it's the foundation of a story. Certainly tension, you need tension to have a good piece of fiction of one form or another. Even in a comedy, there's some kind of tension going on. Uh, but the truth is it's all about characters. You cannot have a story without a character. They don't always have to be human characters. Um, you can have dwarves, you know, from uh, Lord of the Rings, that sort of thing. And um, But also there have been a number of books that have done quite well where all the characters are uh, inhuman. There's something other. So, for example, Richard Bach's uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Uh, it's all about seagulls. Of course, they've been anthropomorphized. That is, they have human traits. They think, they wonder, they worry. Uh, they do all of those things, but it's it's a it's a bunch of seagulls that reflect humanity. You see it again in the uh, Richard Adams Watership Down. It's rabbits, uh, and the, you know what their culture is like and the things they have to deal with. George Orwell really took it to, uh, to the limit in Animal Farm, where every animal um, talks, thinks, reasons, plans, schemes. Uh, they can talk to each other. Uh, and they try to overthrow first their farmer, and then uh, it goes on from there. And of course, it's it's a bit of fantasy meant to teach something, uh, which is what George Orwell is is doing with that. But now he mixes them because there are human characters too. But uh, they all have this, what you're talking about is a sense of uh, physicality. So when you read George Orwell, you know the the lead pig, mm -hmm. uh, great line: the pigs are standing upright. Um, the, the pigs have a, a physical description. There's an old horse that plays a key role 
you know what the horse looks like. Uh, that's true for all the major characters, probably for all the speaking characters. And so it's it's very, very important uh, to do that. I was going to add one, one thing to it because then we're going to get into it a little bit deeper here. But let me just throw this out. When you think of doing characters, um, really what you want to do is sketch because the reader is going to bring something to it. Mm -hmm. If you over detail, you'll bore the reader um, and you'll disrupt their imagination and they want to contribute to it too. So normally you'll give the basics and uh, reveal stuff over time and uh, they'll add to it. If you don't show the physical nature of your characters, the readers will fill in and then for some reason it will stop fitting for some reason. So that's that's an important thing you have here with this physicality. Yeah, there's an interesting kind of a, a I guess it seems like a contradiction um, in terms of readers and the relationship that they have with characters, physical descriptions. Um, and that is if there is, this is something that Brett Anthony Johnston used to say, um, that if there's no details, if you don't include any physical details about what your characters, uh, their physical appearance, um, readers don't imagine things. Um, just calling someone grandma does not conjure up an image of um, my grandmother. However, the more you describe grandma, the more detail you give. And it doesn't have to be a lot. Just give me a couple, you know, important, relevant details. Um, I'm going to take those details. And as a reader, I'm either going to accept them or reject them. But I will fashion my own character in my mind from your description. Uh, think of it as providing um, the materials from which a reader can construct uh, a, a facsimile of your character. They need those details. If you give them a two by four, they may take it, they may sand it, they may paint it a different color, um, but at least they have that two by four. In the same way, if you don't describe a character, they have nothing to work with, no materials. Um, but if you give them enough, just one or two details here and there, they can kind of construct their own. This is why uh, you'll see a book cover and there's a character on the front and you go, that character is not who I imagined. Well. The, the character may on the book cover may look exactly as the character is described in the book, uh, but we still will adapt those uh, images that we come up with um, based on, on what we want. But we can't do that without the materials first. So whether that's, you know, the color of something as simple as the color of the hair or the, the, the shape of someone's nose, um, I think that really what you want to do is focus in on if you're describing physical looks, focus on the things that set them apart, the things that are not average, the things that they have control over. How many piercings do they have? How many tattoos? Um, do they have any particular scars? Um, it, do they wear their hair a particular way in a particular style? Uh, do they paint their nails? If so, how, well, like what colors, um, those types of things that they have control over, that's going to tell us more about our character, um, than simply the fact that they're six foot two. Uh, you can't really control how tall you are unless you're wearing high heels. Does that make sense? Uh, I never wear high heels. Oh, oh, it was what you're saying makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, it does. You know, uh, for example, one of the key elements in Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame is the phys physical nature of uh, the protagonist. Uh, you know, without that, we lose a lot. Uh, in fact, you might not even have a story uh, without that. Uh, even if your character is a ghost, there's still a description. Think of uh, uh, Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol. You can see those ghosts because they're described. So they have a physicality, though technically speaking, they're spirits. So it doesn't matter who the characters are, whether they're animals, humans, um, spirits, demons, it doesn't really matter. Angels, there's some physicality that needs to be uh, described mm -hmm. with that. Sorry, I'm trying to do Molly's job, which is, you know, share all this wonderful information and keep up with the chat room. It's quite the challenge. So, <laughs> so if I'm in and out, uh, I apologize, but um, we do want to talk about the, the, again, unique aspects of our characters. The physiology specifically um, needs to be as unique as their psychology, needs to be as unique as their personality. Um, think of the body as a living textbook of our own history uh, or of our character's history more appropriately. Every scar has a story. Um, diseases sometimes have long-term physical repercussions. Every accident, every injury, et cetera, can linger 
Um, you see this often when you hang out with people like I do. And, you know, we're all human barometers. Well, it's probably going to rain tonight. My knee's acting up or, oh, I got that catch in my back. So, you know, it's probably going to be sunny today or whatever the case may be where you start to feel things in your joints and in your, your bones. And um, this is from the toll that life has taken on your body. And I'm not saying that everyone has to have some sort of horrendous, you know, handicap, um, but it's nice. <laughs> that sounds weird. <laughs> uh, but they should have something, um, whether it's, uh, you know, a chronic foot pain or maybe it's quite the opposite. Maybe they're an athlete and uh, they're in tip top shape and they are, you know, injury free. Um, that, that can, uh, you know, develop your character in a particular way or especially somebody who's like that and then they lose that ability if they've been in to some sort of car accident and now they have to learn to navigate life in in a body that's very different than what they're used to um and it pops as you point out this can play into their psychology as well yeah and it can dictate a lot of their choices uh that they make or why they respond the way they do uh so and i'll probably mention this book again later but in my book wounds i have a, a seminary professor um, and he is just not physically impressive at, at all. In fact, in my first book, um, uh, By My Hands, uh, I purposely modeled uh, my protagonist after a very unimpressive looking but brilliant man uh, that uh, I had in, encountered. Uh, and so sometimes they don't have to be the best looking. They just need to be unique. They need to have something that, that goes with it. And in my book, Wounds, there's a reason for the way he is and, and why he doesn't you know, stand fully erect and things uh, like that. It's because of things that he had to endure in his life that still haunt him. So uh, I agree with you. Every scar has a story. And uh, that plays a role in the, in the development of the character. A lot of this information and, and these ideas, I, I should give credit to Gail Brandeis, who is a, um, a professor of mine, a, a mentor of mine at Antioch University when I was getting my master's degree. One of the exercises that she had us do, and I use that term uh, loosely, but also literally, was to get up and walk around. Like she said, go grab a, a notepad and a pen. Here we go. And we all got up and we walked around. What does it feel like to walk? Uh, what's it feel like to walk? And then we ran for a little bit. What's it feel like to run? Um, you want to put your character in motion. Uh, she did not have us get into fist fights, but uh, we can imagine what that would be like. So what does it feel like if your your character is in some sort of fist fight, if they've got some sort of bare knuckle brawler, um, or if they're you know defending themselves or their family or whatever the case may be, they're being attacked by ninjas. Uh, what's it feel like? Um, what does it feel like when they're in a, a car accident or uh, if something positive, a, a, a positive feeling? I don't want to get too weird, you know, but maybe like a, a nice warm shower after working out um, or, you know, with the, the tense muscles in the back, having a nice hot shower to kind of relax those or getting a massage. Maybe it's something relaxing. It doesn't always have to be awful, but uh, that those tangible experiences are going to be best seen when your character is in action, when their body is, is working. Um, Pops, you were talking about North Dallas 40 with this. Yeah. Um, you know, not a favorite movie of mine, but one of the things that impressed me, if I'm remembering it right, you tell me if I'm, I'm not, uh, but it's loosely based on the Dallas Cowboys. That's sort of the the premise, though it's not really them. But it, it shows, I think it was the quarterback. Was that Nick Nolte, Mac Davis, one of them, whoever played the quarterback. Uh, one of the opening scenes is you see him in a tub soaking, and then he has to try to get out of the tub, and he can barely walk. And there's these uh, flashbacks, I think. But anyway, he was remembering uh, how he got each bruise, where he'd been hit. Uh, and when you think about what uh, goes on in football, that you know that uh, they look strong and, and uh, able to take anything while they're playing. But I'm pretty sure Monday comes and uh, it's a whole different ball game. And then if you see them when they get older, some of them are pretty well crippled up from it. Mm. Uh, but th those events that happen on the football field made that movie made him more realistic because of the pains that he had. Um, and that's a great thing to do in your writing if you can give somebody some kind of problem. I mean, you don't have to cripple them all up, but there's there's something uh, that makes them real to us uh, and that uh, some of the readers, and hopefully all the readers, can in some way relate to. 
uh, you know, what does that feel like? Indeed. So there's to do that, to, to work that out. Uh, we want to think of our characters in terms of biology. Um, and this is where I think it takes a lot of, of work on our part, a lot of deep imagining, as Brett Anthony Johnston says, is to think of our characters in terms of their biology. We're, we may not be doctors, but we have our own physical body. So we're familiar with what it, it's like to walk around in this world. Um, think about your character's lungs and heart. If they're running, uh, they're going to feel that not only in their legs, but maybe in, as they're swinging their arms. Um, I've got I don't want to get too personal here, but I've got a, a tendonitis in one shoulder and a, my other shoulder was separated for uh, about a week and a half. So it just dislocates all the time. And so I've got really bad shoulders. And uh, when I run, that's where I feel it in my shoulders. Um, think about, you know, their eyes and their ears, their joints and their muscles. Uh, think about their bones. Um, maybe they're in perfect condition. Maybe they're not. Maybe they've honed their muscles to be fine specimens of, of strength and and agility like spider-man or maybe they're not maybe they're more like me <laughs> so uh you know are your characters in some way disabled and if so in what way be careful with this one um because if you're writing about a character who's disabled you want to make sure that you're being respectful of it and that it doesn't become a joke um and that uh you're doing it with some sense of authenticity um if you're writing about a a paraplegic um you may want to run it past somebody who's either in that position or know someone in that position or, you know, find a Facebook group or something like that to say, you know, I, I want to do this to where it's accurate and believable and, and is respectful. Um, it's very easy to kind of, um, if to, it's called writing the other to write about someone different than us and to do it in a way that is, uh, ignorant, and can come across as offensive. So if you're doing that, and and I encourage you to stretch your, your writing and stretch yourself. And I really, really encourage you to write about people who are not like you. I think one of our biggest problems as beginning writers is that we want to model every character after ourselves. All of our protagonists are the same as, as we are. It's easier to do it that way. I want to encourage you to get beyond that and to stretch yourself, but also do the research that's required so that you can do it appropriately. Um, how how does this physical body affect your character as they move through life? Do they have a job where they are throwing heavy boxes around? Do they have a job where they're sitting at a desk all day? If they sit at a desk all day, they may have a bad back. They're probably they might have some sort of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. They might have trouble with their wrists. Whatever the case may be, think about those. Jerry Rice, one of the greatest football players in NFL history, pops. I don't know if you know this or not. You know what he used to do in the summer as a, as a kid, his summer job? Dancing? Oh, no, his uh, summer job? No. His summer job was his dad was a bricklayer. And so he laid bricks with his dad. And his, what did they do? They threw him the bricks and he would catch them and hand them to his father. So his older brother was throwing him bricks. He caught bricks all day, every day throughout the summer from his childhood. Uh, football is a little bit easier than a brick. Uh, but even if it's thrown by Montana. Yeah. And so he's, he's got the hands for it. Like that helped him. Um, so a couple, a couple tips here to kind of get you thinking in these terms, you really want to put your character in motion, make them run, make them fight, make them dance, uh, make them exercise, uh, make them in some way exert some sort of physical, uh, force. Uh, they need to strive for something physically, uh, put them in an extreme setting. Pops, you did this, uh, the, uh, it, it was beneath the ice. Mm. Uh, they're up in Alaska and, and you, you open that up on a hot summer day and you, you wrap a blanket around yourself because, uh, the descriptions and the physical descriptions of the characters being cold. Is, Antarctica. Yeah. They were in Antarctica, not Alaska. Yeah. That's, that's what I said. There's absolutely no evidence to say that I said Alaska. Except no, it's recording. No. Yeah. But, but I can see they're, they're. <laughs> They're close. They're they're really close geographically. They're, you know? Yeah, it's, they're yeah. just a world away. It's not a big deal. Yes, so. <laughs> but if your setting is, is extreme, whether it's uh, you know Alaska or Antarctica or the Sahara, um, we should feel that. We should feel the heat of the Saharas. We should feel the humidity of the the rainforest. Uh, those types of things. Um, I don't know about you, pops, but when it gets hot, my body completely shuts down. If we're in triple digits, I just don't go outside. There's nothing good outside that's ever going to happen to me. Uh, I don't even like the 90s. 95? No. 
just stop, just give it up. You know, I'm, I'm going to be inside and, you know, like a, a, a tub of ice. I just, I don't, I don't deal well with the heat. Uh, if it's cold, I love it. And let's go. I mean, it was raining today. It was hailing. Uh, I love that. Try and spend some time out there. Um, it rejuvenates me. Uh, you ever have a sunburn? Oh, oh man. Stories I could tell you. Uh, uh, I've, I've been really stupid with the sun <laughs> and I've been, um, yeah, I've been burned. You know what? I, you were talking about the, the, the story I said in Antarctica, uh, beneath the ice. And that's one of the things I focused on was, uh, what my characters are going through since Antarctica is very high. A lot of people don't realize that, but it, it's high altitude. And one of the problems, depending where you are, unless you're just right down by the ocean, but if you're further inland, uh, the uh, one of the things you have to deal with is altitude sickness. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe, you know, down at the bottom of the world and stuff, but it it is that high. The air is that thin, and one of the things that uh, it does is uh, it gives you headaches. That's one of the things, and so you have to acclimate with all of that. And in fact, with one of the what I thought was one of the funniest lines in any of my books had to do with that. Um, they're they're talking to uh, uh, Perry Sachs, this woman. The, she's the doctor trying to get him acclimated. And he's been complaining a little bit about his headache. And he said, well, you must drink water. You have to drink a lot of water. You need to drink enough water till your urine runs uh, uh, clear. And he says, I, I don't talk about urine until our second date. Um <laughs> Uh, and then that was that was the end of it. But the, the point was there was uh, taxing to be there, and that was part of the physicality. Oh, absolutely, and it and it's memorable because, and that's a little bit of authenticity too, because you've done some research. You're really good about doing your research and figuring that kind of stuff out. What is the physical toll of being in this environment? Um, but yeah, I, I remember I had a quick story. I had a sunburn on my feet, yeah, oh, so horrible. bad. I, I put sunscreen everywhere else, but the tops of my feet, I don't know what I was thinking. Purple. My feet were purple and swollen. That was, I've done um, that. and then, I've done that. and then the next day throw on my, uh, my dress shoes and go to work at Mervyn's and be on my feet all day. That was, uh, that was a different kind of misery. Um, Dave in the chat room mentions, uh, that he's seen characters or he always likes when uh, a character is injured and they're not immediately healed the next day. Uh, and it's easy for us to do that, especially if we're writing action or something, they get in a, you know, big bruiser, you know, they get in a fight and, you know, they get knocked around, but they end up winning. You ever seen a boxer on day two, the day after? Yeah. I don't think you have <laughs> because they don't go out. They don't let cameras in. They don't get out of bed. Um, they, they hurt and that pain should continue on the next day. So thinking about those things, uh, that does two things. Not only does it build uh, our perception, uh, the reader's perception of the character, it makes the character feel real and tangible and, and believable. Um, and it, it also heightens the stakes. Physical, you can really heighten the stakes with physical uh, descriptions of your characters and thinking about how things move on and and develop and how those injuries or illnesses kind of progress and, and linger. Um, it becomes a part of them and and Readers really appreciate that. So uh, moving on to pillar two. Yes. Uh, I was just thinking about what you were telling me, thinking about other um, other situations like that where you uh, you apply what you've experienced. And that's, that's really the case. You don't have to experience all of these things. Um, I've never been punched in the nose, but I have been uh, hit in the face with a rapidly moving basketball. Mm -hmm. so I can tell you what it's like to get uh, smacked in the nose. Um, and I've, I've been hit in the mouth by a very fast moving baseball. Um, so, you know, and I, I, I use those sensations when I talk about the, some of the pain that they feel. Yeah. The pillar two is a little different. We've talked about the physicality, the physical nature, again, whether it's, it's human, you know, spiritual rabbits, whatever it might be, but mm -hmm. there's some physical physicality. There's another part to the human, uh, experience and that is psychology yes and this is one i think where we really have a, a problem i say we as writers especially new writers have a problem writing people who are all like us uh, we tend to write about characters that are like us and they become our protagonists and then we tend to write about other characters that we would like people who interact with us in a way that we would uh, like but 
there's a wide variety of people out there. I recommend uh, that as a writer that you bookmark 16personalities.com. Super great resource. Uh, what you can do there is they've got all the different personality types broken down. And this is going to be um, standard psychology stuff. It doesn't get too deep into it, uh, but it'll tell you like ENFJ and ISJT. And I, I'm, I'm having trouble coming up with them off the top of my head, but um, it tells you what each letter stands for, uh, personality type, um, how they work together, uh, examples of famous people who have this personality type, what other types of, what other personality types they tend to be attracted to or like to hang out with. Uh, we've heard the old term that opposites attract, and that's is very, very true. But uh, on a on a very basic level, and I don't want to get too far into it because I'm not a psychologist. I haven't done um, a ton of research into psychology, but I have spent a fair amount of time researching, you know, the the psychology of characters. Um, it is the basic one of the basic breakdowns is extroverts versus introverts. Um, do you like being with people or do you not like being with people? Do you prefer to be alone or do you prefer to be in a group? Uh, do you hang out with your friends? Uh, if you are at a party, where are you? Are you standing along the wall? Um, are you right in the middle of, of the greatest story? You're telling the story and everybody's listening to you. You're kind of the life of the party. Um, those types of things. And there's a lot more to it. There's thinking versus judging. There's feeling versus um I forget the other one, thinking versus feeling, those types of things. Um, but in in spending some time here and doing some research, what it's going to let you do is imagine characters that are not like you, who will make choices differently than you would make. And this is, is kind of tough because sometimes we'll write about a character making a decision that doesn't seem to fit their personality type at all. Uh, we want to write about the hero, but we're introverts. And so we talk about this great gregarious leader, but then they're doing things that don't really make a lot of sense um, with that personality type. So knowing that um, and asking yourself some some tough questions like, where is your character comfortable? Uh, where are they uncomfortable? That's actually a more important question because that's going to bring in some conflict. Uh, how do they react to conflict? Uh, who are they attracted to? and why um what are their common strengths and weaknesses what you can do here is kind of pick and choose um you find the right kind of psychological makeup for your character uh, and you find points in your story to let these different facets of their personality shine uh, you put them in conflict because they're uncomfortable here uh, you show how they resolve things. Uh, you show them running away from a situation um, that they're not comfortable in. You show them going to great lengths to avoid going to a party because they're just not comfortable there. Um, but they're torn because, you know, the person that they like is much more of an extrovert and wants to go to this party. So there's some tension there. Those are the types of things that you want to think about when you're doing character psychology. The important thing that I really stress is that you want to be consistent. You want to build a character who is consistent according to their psychology and behaves in a way that's consistent with their psychology and their physicality. Um, so having those two things working together is going to help create a unique uh, personage, a unique character. Imagine there are 16 different types of, of psychology, uh, personality types, how many different types of physical bodies are there? Who knows how many, but you multiply those two numbers together and that is a ridiculously high number of different combinations and permutations of people that populate our world um, that we can either use as models for our characters or we can at least with this information kind of deeply imagine them um, so that we can write again, as we've discussed earlier, we can write about the other in a believable and respectful way. So psychology pops, you, you have some points to make here too. Um, yeah, about Ellis Poe. Mm -hmm. I mentioned him a little bit earlier. This was a, a book I wrote about five years ago called Wounds. And it's, it's, it's kind of a, a rugged book for me uh, because I became more intense on both the violence and the uh, crimes and things like that. But my character is a, one of those least likely heroes. Ellis Poe. And uh, for him to be what I needed him to be, I had to uh, break him down quite a bit. 
he was living a, a, a self-imposed exile. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he's a, a seminary professor. He likes that because he gets to spend a lot of time in his office, which he keeps dark. He only has one light on. It's over his desk. And I got that idea, by the way, from somebody uh, uh, when I was uh, doing some college teaching uh, from the president of the college. He did that. He kept his office dark with just one light and then have the uh, window shade pulled at all times. Uh, and what he really was doing is shutting out his life. Uh, I mean, the life outside, he was shutting out uh, anything that might get to him. He wants really to be alone. His preferred place to live was on a tiny boat at a Coronado. Uh, because it just isn't room for anyone else. Uh, and now with that, you see, I've got this this wonderful character that I could now torture by throwing him into a situation where he has to be brave. He has to uh, help people he uh, is really afraid of. Um, uh, and in my particular case, uh, he has to work with this female detective who... Uh, uh, is related to the very thing that injured him, the person. And so that get very complicated for him. Uh, so he was really the, uh, the perfect character to force to do everything he would not normally do. Uh, and that required the physicality, but also required the psychology. And that was, I had to delve into uh, what guilt can do to a person, uh, what phobia can do, uh, what unresolved uh, guilt, uh, will also do. So it was uh, it was kind of grueling, really, uh, for me to write. Hmm. Uh, I think the book turned out just fine. Um, but uh, we as writers, we live it. Yeah, At least I do. It's uh, I feel like I've lived it. Writing, we tend to be empathetic with our characters. And yes, so, yeah, yes. we have to put ourselves in that position. And it can be very grueling. Uh, Pops, the chat room agrees with you about wounds. Um, Andy mentioned that he bought one, let's see, for his dad and his father-in-law and his brother-in-law and his sister. So um, I guess he liked the book okay. Well, that or he dislikes those people. <laughs> yeah. He was trying... <laughs> Let it me was... teach you a thing or two. Here, read this. He had a few white elephant gifts he had to go to. So, <laughs> you know... Uh... <laughs> But uh, Sophia had a question earlier about uh, the character physicality. I'll jump to it real quick because it's sure. going to be hard for me to kind of go back at the end, I think. But uh, her question was, she's got some a, a pregnant character, perhaps more. Um, and her question was simply, how much detail is too much? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would say that really largely depends on your target audience, uh, the market that you're writing for. If you're writing for women, I would say that you could give as much detail as necessary uh, as, from a man's perspective, give me all the details about, um, this is going to sound weird, what it feels like to be pregnant, um, what the particular pain feels like, a contraction. I've never felt, you know, a contraction. So it's going to be hard for me to imagine that or the particular pain in the back, um, that might come with it or, or in the legs or, or whatever else comes along with that. Um, I think, you know, put as much as you want in there. Now, in terms of birth, that's a different story uh, that you may want to um, well, handle. Well, what I did, I, I was in that situation. Uh, in the my book Prodigy, it starts in, in the Appalachian Mountains now, with a were you Were you pregnant or were you writing about a pregnant character? I just want to... We don't talk about that. We, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> no. yeah, I had a pregnant character, um, and just this poor woman in Appalachia, and the midwife is delivering the baby. And I got to the part where I had to describe the birth because it was very important uh, to what goes on later. So um, I belong to this online writers group. So I just asked all the women, what is it like to give birth? And I'm asking a bunch of writers. So I got more description than I really cared for, I think. Uh, and there were some, I just knew I, I can't use that. Uh, but it's, that's one way you, you can do it. And I got, uh, I got fairly graphic, but not, not too much. Just, you get as graphic as you need to be to get the point across. Mm -hmm. Okay, you but it is not a, uh, how to deliver a baby. Uh, that's probably not part of your novel. Right, right, right. And again, it goes back to the market. I mean, if you're writing a medical book, all of the details. Uh, but if you're writing fiction for a largely male audience, that's something else to consider, too. You, you're probably going to want to pull back a little bit on that. And you know this, too. Uh, I was at the birth of uh, all the kids, uh, of course, mm -hmm. It was only two deliveries because we had two at one time. Got a special deal at uh, Costco. Yeah. Um, 
but I was there. So I know what it looks like. And I know what goes on in the delivery room. And I know what the doctors and the nurses do. I, I memorized all that stuff. So I had a good handle on that. What I didn't have a handle on was what it felt like. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and how it affects the mind and what you're thinking at that time. Um, you know, of course, I asked my wife and stuff, but I try to get as many opinions as I could about that. Because while I can observe how it all appears on the outside, I, I could never, ever fully imagine what it's like. And I needed someone to describe it. And uh, asking uh, female writers that are mothers what it's like, you'll get uh, probably more than you want to know. Uh, and then if you already know what it's like, then uh, you don't really need to do that. Uh, so sometimes to, to answer the other question without going too far, you, ha- you have to be the decision maker on that. And sometimes we want to go too far because we enjoy the process and there's a little something about having something shocking in the book. But you have to sell a thing too. So my suggestion is this. In your initial writing, when you're in the first and maybe second draft, you put in whatever you want. But when you're getting down to it and you're thinking now, okay, I've got editors who are going to be looking at this and they're going to be looking for reasons to reject it. Not because they're mean, but they can't take everything. So. if you help them out by giving them some reason to reject it, they'll take it. Uh, so then you ask yourself, is this part really important? Mm. About how much detail do I need? Um, and also depending on what market you're writing for you know, if you, and what genre. In some horror fiction, they get very detailed. Uh, but maybe you don't need that if you're um, you know, writing a Western or something. So uh, it, it's really going to be up to you. But my suggestion is you can write whatever you want in your first or second draft uh, because you can always take it out. And so it's there. But then you uh, you go ahead and and take it out. I agree. I agree. That's always been my policy. More is better um, in earlier drafts. And then you can trim it. One of the, the advantages to doing that is you find the most relevant details, the best details, the most impactful details, and then you can trim the rest. Um, one thing that that's that's a way to avoid being gratuitous is you don't give all of the details. You just give the one detail that suggests all of the details. Remembering that the reader is going to be inserting their own imagination into it. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to delineate all of that. But you can go ahead and do that um, it, when you're doing the first writing, because when you go back to it, you may say, this is too much. This doesn't work. This is distracting from what happens next. Um, it's stealing the show and it's not meant to be the show. Uh, so, you know, that's the beauty of working in multiple drafts. You write whatever you want in the first draft. No one else is going to see it, but you, um, that's where you work out the problems. As a reader, it can also feel redundant. If you give me that one detail that lets me, uh, construct the others, and then you give me those others. Uh, my comment is I, I figured that out on my own. Um, yeah. you just gave me that first one. That's perfect. That's all I need. I'm actually, uh, going through a manuscript for a, a friend of mine. And that's one of the comments that I've kind of made is, is this detail is so strong. You don't need these three or four details that follow it up. Um, but sometimes it takes another eye to see that. Uh, and you definitely want to do that on your own in your second, third, fourth, fifth drafts. Um, but uh, eventually you may still have an editor say, eh, let's trim this back a little bit more. And that's fine. Um, or they may say, hey, can you, you ramp this up a little bit? Can you give us a little bit more? Sure. Um, either way, uh, that's what editors are for. So, uh, But I think it's better to overwrite and then trim than it is to underwrite and try and, and come up with more later. Uh, third pillar, uh, so that we can kind of get through these last two here. The third one is uh, character status. Now, i got to give credit uh, to Stephen James here. This is a almost exclusively pulled from at least an article that he wrote for uh, Writer's Digest um, on character status. And the information is, you know, comes from him. I've kind of adapted a little bit of it, but the idea is, is definitely from him. And it's something that I try and, and keep in mind as I'm writing because it really helps us to see a complete character and the inherent contradictions within a character. Now, that sounds somewhat uh, contradictory for me to say that a character should be consistent, but then also to have the inherent contradictions within a character. Uh, what I'm trying to to get at is that we are complex people, and sometimes we do things that don't seem to make sense, but there are real reasons why. Um, a lot of this is because 
not uh, necessarily of just who we are, but who we are interacting with. Um, I do not like crowds of people. I really don't. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. We just went to a party where I didn't know anybody. I hung out with my son the whole time we were on our phones, um, much to my wife's dismay. Uh, but she likes that. She wants to go and meet people and talk to people. I, I can't do that. In that kind of a, a situation, I would have what's called low status. I don't like to talk to people. I keep my eyes down. I look away. Um, I don't engage necessarily in conversations because I, I, I'm uncomfortable. Uh, people say, but but you're a, a teacher and you're able to teach students and you seem confident and collected. And well, yeah, that's because I know why they're there. I know what I'm, I know what's expected of me. Um, I'm in a high status there uh, as opposed to a low status where I'm at a party and I, I don't know anyone. Um, so your a character status can change. And when we talk about status, we're talking about high status or low status. Um, a high status person, think more of like a dominant type of a person. They're generally going to be confident and relaxed. Um, when they walk, they're going to have loose gestures uh, and a gait. They're going to maintain eye contact. They don't look away. They maintain eye contact for a variety of reasons, whether that's to threaten or intimidate or control or even to seduce in particular situations. Uh, they are not very fidgety, but they're calm and in control. They don't always answer questions right away, but they can control a conversation. Uh, they blink infrequently. Uh, and one of the things that I think is neat is they, quote unquote, allow people to help them. If you ever think about uh, managers in your office, you can tell if they're high status or low status because the high status managers are really great to work for because they allow people to work for them or to help them. Whereas low status managers are constantly saying, you have to do this, you have to do that. And they, they're they more, uh, I guess, pushy. They're pushier. And that's a sign of them being in low status. They feel like they're not in control. So they want to try to elevate their status and they don't know how to do that. Um, really, these high status people, the, the defining characteristic is their confidence, um, that they're confident in who they are. Um, and they, they become kind of these natural leaders, low status people, um, contrarily, uh, they have constricted strides. Um, their voice is sometimes uneven. They will perhaps have poor posture. They gesture a lot more. Uh, they look down, they bite their lips, they hide their faces with their hands. Um, something like this, where the hand is over the mouth. Uh, that's a, a kind of a low status kind of a thing. They tend to be fidgety. Uh, they get agitated very easily. Uh, they'll apologize and agree more. They tend to try and please. Um, these are, are more of the low status people. And then you have a third category of people, which I find really interesting. And these are negotiators. These are characters who are instinctively in tune to other character statuses. Um, and they can mirror those statuses. And Pops, I remember years ago when I was first starting to look for jobs, um, you taught me at a job interview to kind of try and mirror the interviewer and mm -hmm. if they were you know had that very erect posture and that very you know formal voice and they were very in control this type of type a kind of a personality if you will that that's what you should do as an you know when you're interviewing with them or if they're more confident and relaxed and they lean back a little bit more a little more casual that you can do that as well um, and I didn't really understand it at that time, but it's, it's a way of putting the other person at ease. You put the interviewer at ease and what they see is this is somebody who understands me. This is somebody who I could get along with because, uh, I'm in a particular status. They're in a particular status. And so I think I can work with this person. Um, negotiators are really good at that and they can, um, even manipulate other characters, um, by moving themselves up to a higher status or moving themselves down to a lower status, if they, that's necessary. Um, whatever the case may be, you really want to kind of sell it. And your diction should reflect the status of the character. Somebody who wails is not as in control as somebody who um, perhaps screams um, or doesn't scream in that case, because they're more in control. So playing with that, you can really develop your character. Show them in high status. If they're at work, and they are the boss and everything they say gets done and people grovel around them. But when they get home, you know, the wife is clearly in charge. And this this poor man is, is henpecked. And yes, dear. No, dear. You're very welcome, dear. 
uh, these types of things to show them in high status versus low status. Um, Stephen James uses the example of his uh, his character in the the pawn and the the rook and why can't I th pa Patrick Bowers um, might be high status at work, but when he comes home, he's got a daughter and the daughter is really calling the shots because he he just loves her so much and so um, she can gets away with stuff that maybe she shouldn't get away with. So the, your characters can move between statuses and that kind of shows us a more complete picture of who they are. Does all that make sense, Pops? Yeah, it does because we do fill certain roles in society. Um, you know, we, we sometimes adopt them from our, uh, our parents. You know, you're describing, you didn't like people. I mean, just, you're describing me the whole time. And the, the, Naomi, your wife likes to be around people and party and that's your mom. So, I remember several times I'd have to go out of town for something and uh, the next day she would have a party because <laughs> I don't like parties. So, yeah. you know, I don't have anybody over. <clears throat> um, and then I was gone. So, you know, there was no reason not to. Uh, it's just very different. And now, is is that why when, I, when we were growing up, you would have us throw the parties when you were gone? You said, don't throw the parties while I'm here. Just have the raging, thrashing parties while I'm gone. Is that? Yeah. Uh, oh, you never said that, did you? Uh, we're just going to forget all about that. Yeah. that <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that that's a, a good example there of, of high status, low status. And I know I get that from you, Pops. Thank you for that, by the way. Uh, yeah, well, after uh, all that lying you just did about me, why don't we go ahead and talk about spirituality? Okay. Uh, I'm going to say four Hail Marys. And uh, so the, the fourth pillar is spirituality. And this is one that I've added. And uh, a lot of times people get, I don't want to say uncomfortable, but oh, well, you know, is this going to be preachy? N not really. I, here's what it boils down to. Everybody has a spiritual side. Even atheists, um, even the most devout atheist is spiritual. Um, even the most devout scientist who says there is no such thing as a soul, there's only the, the body. I, I don't know if anybody says that, but let's imagine that they do. That's a type of spirituality. That is their belief. That's their belief system. Uh, and so when we talk about spirituality, that's really what we're talking about is their belief system. It might be an organized religion. It might not. It might be some sort of cult, or it could just be uh, something more new agey, or it could be um, atheism, or it could be agnosticism. Uh, whatever it is, your character has to have an opinion on the spiritual world. Um, that needs to be developed. Now, it doesn't need to be the focus of your character. Your character doesn't have to be a preacher. They don't have to be a Christian. They don't have to be a, a Muslim or, or Hindi or um, anything like that. Uh, they could be, like I say, an atheist. They could be an agnostic. Uh, whatever the case may be, they have an opinion on spiritual matters. Okay. Uh, what matters here is being specific. Even if your character can't e specify, if they can't be specific, you should still have a specific understanding of where they are, spiritually speaking. Uh, try not to just say Christian, uh, but give us Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or Pentecostal. Um, think about, you know, that kind that layer of specificity. Uh, maybe they're East, Eastern Orthodox. Uh, are they atheist or agnostic? What's the difference between the two? Well, one doesn't believe in God and one doesn't know if there's a God. Uh, one doesn't, maybe, maybe they're apathetic and they don't care. Apath, apathostic? What would you call a, somebody who doesn't care if there's a God or not? Um, but, uh, maybe they believe in, in karma or the great unknown, or maybe they have, and this is something that I've seen more and more often is a personal, uh, construct of spirituality. I believe that heaven is a big bowl of uh, chocolate sauce and cotton candy. What do you base that on? I just think that's what heaven looks like. Uh, I have my own heaven. We all have our own hells. There is no hell. There is a their heaven. Whatever the case may be, they've got some sort of opinion that's been formed based on their life experiences, based on their personality, based on the people that they've surrounded themselves with, uh, based on perhaps their physical the physical nature of, of their composition, uh, their physical body. Um, but how your character perceives a spiritual world, even if it's to say that it doesn't exist, is going to help shape your character. And it's going to shape the, the characters around them and how your characters interact. I We get this idea that if we're writing secular fiction, we can't have a Christian in secular fiction because, you know, well, 
the secular market doesn't want Christians. Or if we're writing Christian fiction that we can't have non-believers. We can't write about non-believers in Christian fiction because, oh, it's it's Christian, so everybody has to be a Christian. And realistically, we tend to surround ourselves, if, if we are of a particular faith, we tend to surround ourselves with people of the similar faith. If we are non-believers, we tend to surround ourselves with non-believers. But the reality is that you go to work and not everybody at work believes the way that you do. And so we have these interactions, these daily interactions with people who have opposing viewpoints, not just politically, but also spiritually, physically, whatever the case may be, personality types. Um, these types of conflicts can really help shape your characters. Uh, are they really casual in their beliefs or are they really super adamant? Are they very legalistic or are they more liberal? Um, do they proselytize? Are they on the street corner with signs saying the end is near? Um, or do they hide their faith? Are they afraid of their faith? Um, they don't want people to know that they are of this particular faith or denomination or whatever the case may be. Uh, knowing this about your character is going to help deepen your understanding of them, and it's going to really kind of develop your writing. Now, some say that that you, you want a spiritual arc for your character. I think you need a character arc. I think characters should have a character arc. It doesn't have to be a spiritual arc. Okay, They could right. start off as a believer, end as a believer, start off as a non-believer, end as a non-believer. Maybe their character arc is more in, in their growth as, as who they are as a person and their personality or their physicality or, or one of the other aspects that we've talked about. But they should go through some sort of arc, go through some sort of change. It doesn't have to be spiritual, but it often is. Um, and their views on spirituality often change over the course of a novel based on what they are um, exposed to. And this often takes the, 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 the shape of an epiphany that your character may have, a, a, an understanding or a realization that they didn't have before that is kind of changed their outlook on things. Um, whatever it is or whatever it isn't, it is something that, you should be intimately familiar with as you're writing your character, even if it's not a focal point of the novel itself. Does that make sense, Pops? It does. Um, and some people shy away from it, I think, too much because they think that, uh, as you said, it's going to get preachy and stuff. Not necessarily. Uh, and there have been plenty of um, books in the journal market that have had spiritual themes. Shoes of the Fisherman uh, being one, Morris. Uh, and he, you know, he did several and he had a spiritual aspect, but he wasn't writing Christian literature. Mm -hmm. Okay. He was writing a story uh, in the book I mentioned, he was writing a story about, uh, really, a you know, a common priest who becomes Pope. Uh, so there's always that, or even the lack of spirituality can be a, uh, governing force in a, in a person. It really just depends on the story. Just make it, uh, natural natural outcome of who the character is. Uh, so, you know, even in some of, though I write for the Christian market, uh, even so some of my books were not especially spiritual. You know, there, there were some that were far more, but that all of that came from the story. It was the pressure of the story to have this part. This is what, you know, we have this, this question is what if, then the second question is what happens now? And that was one of the things is what would be the natural outcome of this particular situation. So some have some deep spiritual content. Some don't. Um, it's, you know, they'll have a Christian in it somewhere, um, but th there's nothing preachy about it. It's just one of the people in our world. So, yeah, no, good stuff there. Those are great pillars, uh, all of them. Again, you can get these uh, in the, the notes, the show notes uh, at AaronGansky.com. Usually you have them up in a day or two, right? Yeah, I'll have them up tomorrow. Um, I was kind of in the, the chat room talking about spirituality and chocolate in heaven and those types of things. But, uh, you know, um, I was I was going to mention before we kind of get to our, our sign off that um, my creative writing class selected Hearts Song, my novel that I co-wrote with Cindy Sproles as their novel study project. And so I've been reading it again, and it's been a while since I've read it and looked at it, but uh, one of the aspects was that in this romance, one was a believer um, and one wasn't. And so it was an issue that came up and it was not, it was far from the heart of the, the issue. Uh, it was a, a, an added layer of conflict, um, but it wasn't like this big blow up thing. It wasn't, it wasn't super preachy. Um, there were no like come to Jesus type moments. Um, it was just an aspect of their relationship because 
you're going to have that as if you've got any sort of any sort of relationship between people um these issues tend to come up and so uh being able to have a conversation about it i think is is very powerful um even if it's not the the main focus of the story so uh but there is that it, it, oh my goodness it's 6 30 it's how did we do that that's perfect timing so uh well we Any other questions we i think we handled them all i'm double checking again here um yeah, I, I think there's a lot of uh, comments about uh, our conversation. Not not a lot of questions. So if you did a question and I missed it, I apologize. I am not Molly. I'm not nearly as gifted as, as her in keeping up with the chat room. So uh, thank you for putting up with me tonight. I do appreciate it. Uh, and Molly, we are thinking of you. We miss you. Uh, feel better. Uh, that's what we've got for this week. Next week, uh, we're going to turn our attention from characters to the dramatic question for the novel. Uh, and that should be a lot of fun. That'll be two weeks from now at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and that'll be on YouTube and AaronGansky.com. You can find Pops at AltonGansky.com. You can wish Molly well at FranklyMyDearMojo.com. And you can always find me at AaronGansky.com. So we thank you so much for listening. And until next week, good writing.